Coming up today, Nvidia set to move $300 billion tomorrow. What's the options market predicting? What could be the effect on the S&P 500? What's Wall Street expecting? Goldman Sachs gets bullish. Consumer confidence hits six months highs. Could a bigger Fed cut spook investors? And geopolitical tensions on the rise. Let's go, guys. <laughs> And so here we are stalling out a little bit on the S&P 500 going into the big NVIDIA Q2 earnings report tomorrow night after market close. Market's kind of in a holding pattern the last few sessions going into that. Just stalling out at all-time highs here. Still mostly bullish looking across market color. And so this is a little bit of a make or break for the stock market here. And NVIDIA will have a huge impact on the market, not only tomorrow night, but over the next week or two. Stick with me and I'll show you some data on that very soon. Because just switching over to the NVIDIA chart, pretty much looks just like that at S&P 500. Kind of just stalling out just below all-time highs. Wall Street expectations, they're going to report 64.5 cents per share in earnings tomorrow night. Current market cap, 3.16 trillion. Bit behind Apple's at 3.47, but still bigger than Microsoft at 3.08. So NVIDIA is the second biggest stock in the market. However, more importantly, it's leading this market in the leading sector of semiconductors. Just going out to a weekly chart on SMH, we can see when semis bottomed in October, they've just ripped up really hard and really led this bull market higher. How, like I've been saying, this could be a topping formation at play. This could be a left shoulder right here. This could be a head and who knows, maybe we get some sort of other right hand shoulder and do a head and shoulders formation pattern here. Anything's possible in the stock market. What we do know is Nvidia already holds the record for the biggest one day move in market cap in history, $330 billion. Looking at the options market, dealers are pricing in an implied move of 9.76%, up or down from Wednesday close to Thursday close. And that's pretty much right on all time highs, which is about 10% above where we're trading today, or pretty much just below the 50 day VWAP would be about a 10% move down as well. So the market's predicting come Thursday, Nvidia could be trading around 116 or 140 at all time highs. And this is really kind of a binary event in the stock market up or down, which like I said, is kind of really a bit of a make or break with the stock market sitting right at all time highs. A lot of people really doubtful about this rally, Fed about to start cutting rates, jobs market softening. Now we're on the cusp of Nvidia reporting with it too, just sitting below all time highs. And just looking back in history at the last six quarters, there's a positive correlation of 74% between Nvidia's one week earnings reaction and S&P 500's two week return. So in other words, if Nvidia does well, so does the market. And we can see that just looking at the SPY, pretty much gone sideways for the past week and finishing pretty flat here today on really low volume as well. So the market's kind of coiling up going into this event. And sometimes, and especially if we get a surprise, you can get that uncoiling bit of a direction move on heavy volume as well. And so if they don't come in with earnings and revenue above expectations, and more importantly, forward guidance, real upbeat, optimistic narratives, certainly going to upset the market and Wall Street analyst expectations and their price targets as well. Typically after earnings, you'll see analysts upgrade or downgrade stocks along with their price targets, and they usually herd together with their actions as well. There could also be some supply side concerns, delaying Blackwell AI chip. So investors will be looking to hear a bit more about that. But overall, the street is pretty bullish and expecting an upbeat result. And Jensen Huang does do a pretty good job at hyping everything up. So let's see what he can pull out of the hat tomorrow night. I'll also be paying attention tomorrow night and in Thursday's session to the price action we get in the utility sector. Been doing really well year to date. In fact, it's even outpacing the S&P 500, up 19%. And normally that would be perceived as a big defensive move by the stock market, which a part of it very well could be. However, I think it's mostly been driven from the secular trend of AI and the electrification of the world. Huge increase in demand and projected demand of electricity going forward thanks to these data centers just using so much of it. And so I'll be looking for some correlation between the utility sector and Nvidia's price action tomorrow to further confirm that theory that utilities are trading on the back of an AI boom, which is kind of an interesting setup because normally that's one of the best sectors to be if we do go into a recession. And so it could be a setup of tails win and heads win, whether the AI bull market continues or we do go into a recession and the defensive nature of utilities comes into play once again as well. Goldman Sachs is bullish. They said the stock market's poised for record highs this week as $85 billion floods equities. That's thanks to demand driven by systematic trading strategies and corporate buyback programs. Like I say, there's money constantly flowing into the market. Pension funds, corporate buyback, especially if we break out to new all-time highs tomorrow night, that'll trigger a lot of buy signals from hedge funds that follow trends. And keep in mind the stock market's shut this coming Monday for the Labor Day holiday in the States. Just looking back at history, market performance before Labor Day holiday, the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday going into it, just looking at the S&P 500, 
Interesting, we're up 81% of the time on the Wednesday before. That's tomorrow's session. However, not so good Thursday, Friday, 57% and actually an average net negative return for the Friday before the Labor Day holiday. Another interesting stat for you today, a 20% pre-election year has never meant a lower election year. And that's what we've got this year. We finished up last year. And looking back in history, every time we did that the year before the election, we always finished the election year higher for an average gain of 11.3%. However, you could perceive this next chart either bullish or bearish, depending on your time frame. Households are heavily allocated to stocks among the highest levels in over 70 years at about 40% as a percentage of their financial assets. So I'm assuming that's also looking at money market funds, mutual funds, bonds, cash savings, etc. However, a counter argument to that is it's much easier to invest in stocks these days thanks to commission-free app-based brokers, really low barrier to entry for anyone to invest in stocks versus the old days when a lot of people just saved their cash. I know you could argue that about the 90s and the internet Everyone getting on their PC, eTrade.com. However, I'd say it's much more easier nowadays, even compared to back then, because not everyone was online back in the late 90s either. Mainstream really didn't get online until about the early mid-2000s. Or you could perceive this as the market nearing a peak with peak participation. However, there's nothing to stop this number from going to 50%, and who knows, even 60%. Also interesting to note, Americans are much more invested in their stock market compared to their European and British counterparts. America here up in the grey has listed equity share of household financial assets, 30%. Euros and the Brits down at 10 and 9%. And I'd say a big part of that is because that's what the American stock market looks like over the last 20 years. Absolutely stellar performance, whereas Europe pretty much gone sideways in that time as well. So it's no surprise that Europeans are not as interested as investing in their stock market as Americans. And it's pretty much the same deal for the United Kingdom as well. Stock market's pretty much gone sideways for 20 years. And like I always say, I think there's a number of big reasons for the underperformance of European stock markets. And you can thank that to overregulation, overtaxation, just socialist policies in general that have kind of choked the capital markets and the ability of companies to trade at good valuations and further raise capital, which in turn stifles innovation, job growth, economic growth, etc. However, if that's what most citizens want to vote in, then I guess they're just getting what they want. But just getting back to the states, consumer confidence hits the highest level in six months for August. Once again, mixed readings for the consumer and the economy up and down, with the consumer confidence index rising to 103.3 in August, up from 101.9 in July. That's the highest since February, coming in above expectations as well of 101. Outlook increasing and a slight dip in the predictions of a recession. And this might be on the back of an anticipated cut in interest rates, starting to get consumers excited about what's around the corner. As a look at a long-term chart of the Consumer Confidence Index, you can see it really diving down Going into the GFC, took a bit of a nosedive in COVID. And whilst we're not back to those pre-pandemic levels, obviously consumers not feeling as good as those years 2017 into 2020. Inflation was a lot lower. Consumers had a lot more discretionary spend. However, it does seem to be finding some sort of support here. However, that could easily turn back down as we still have some lower highs. So by no means you can call this an uptrend, be a consolidation at best. But just interesting to see, looking back almost 20 years, it was those years from late 2016 going into 2020. Consumers had never been feeling better. And so the market's excited about the prospect of a 50 basis point cut next month, which j Powell very well could start off with a bang, especially if we get a soft jobs report next Friday. May spook him to want to move big, try and get out in front of a recession. However, that could also make investors nervous that the economy is breaking apart. May see a big rotation into bonds instead of stocks. However, some say the bond market rally's already run its course. Given the fact we've already had a pretty big move in bond yields going into it, you could almost say the two years already priced in a 50 basis point cut and a lot more cuts to follow, given that it's trading at 389, which is a huge gap between where that is and the Fed funds rate currently is 5 25 to 550 and just looking at long duration bonds tlt does look to be holding on to its uptrend ever since it bottomed out in october last year and so if the economy doesn't go into a recession then bond yields may not have a whole lot further to fall may actually start bottoming out however short-term bond yields could come down a little lower but i don't think investors should expect the same returns going forward from long dated bonds as what they've pretty much been conditioned to expect over the last 40 years given the huge Starting valuation of 15% in the early 80s. Relatively healthy US government balance sheet that whole time. However, what's also happened in that time, the US government has waged wars all around the world, spent trillions and trillions of dollars, and they're doing more so in the last couple of years than they've ever done before, creating a huge budget deficit, difference between what the government spends and what it takes in with revenue, tax receipts, and the like. And that's expected to get worse going forward. And that huge spending over the last couple of years is already showing up in the amount of interest the US taxpayer 
pays each day to service their debt. Doubled from 1 billion per day before the pandemic to almost 2 billion per day last year. Just $2 billion a day goes towards servicing US debt. And according to Apollo, under current policies, government debt outstanding will grow from 100% to 200% of GDP at some point in the 2030s. And typically you see a big explosion in government debt in wars. We saw that in World War I, World War II. However, at least at home in the United States, there's no wars, it's just the wars around the world. They really add up in the long run, compound with interest, and just gives competing economic superpowers like China an advantage who don't wage any wars around the world, and that shows up in their balance sheet, given they only have about 60 or 70% of debt to GDP. And the thing is, the Chinese own a lot of US treasuries, just like the Japanese and other large foreign entities around the world, pension funds, insurance companies. You can see that here in the light gray, as the owners of the 25 trillion in treasuries outstanding, that's foreigners in the light gray. Believe it or not, in the dark gray is the Fed. That's right, the government's own subsidiary finances itself through printing money. Households down the bottom in the light green, got banks in the dark blue, insurance companies in the light blue, and mutual funds, pension funds in the orange here. So you could pretty much say over half of the treasury market is fake money and foreign money. And foreigners are pursuing de-dollarization. And if the US dollar ever really goes into a state of panic, that could lead to a big flight of capital and the appetite to buy more US treasuries. And so the point is, the US government keeps spending like crazy, they keep increasing taxes, they keep becoming bigger, they keep waging wars. Not only does it devalue the US dollar, it's going to keep long-term upside pressure on long-dated bond yields just because of the supply and demand. There's so much supply of them out there, and if demand keeps coming down, that's going to keep upside pressure on bond yields. And so in other words, long-dated bonds may not be as good diversifier or hedge as what most people have come to believe given the last 40 years. And a weak US dollar can also keep upside pressure on commodities priced in, in oil fine support recently. Pulled back a little bit today as Goldman Sachs lowers its 2025 oil price outlook to below $80 a barrel. And that's on the back of demand concerns. There's also the secular trend and rise of electric vehicles. A lot of the world pursuing clean energy that does have a little bit of downside pressure on long-term oil. However, just like the US dollar, oil's not going away anytime soon. Humans are likely to be using it for many more decades to come. We will eventually run out at one point, and some people may be surprised to know just how big the oil industry is and what an effect it has on the US economy. Biggest company in the world is Apple. However, the most profitable company in the world, Saudi Aramco, the state-run oil company that they took public and listed on the stock market, made over $120 billion in income last year. That was more than Tesla, Nvidia, Amazon, and Meta combined. However, the Saudis see the long-term future of oil. And this is why they try to offload their company to the public so they can reinvest their proceeds into other industries because they know the West is pursuing clean energy and long-term they may not always be able to print these sort of numbers selling oil to us all. And another thing that could keep upside pressure on oil and gold is elevated geopolitical tensions, which could hit a boiling point before the US federal election. Russia continuing its heavy response to Ukraine and their incursion into Russia, running down heavy missiles, drone attacks, after they did the biggest strike on Ukraine's energy infrastructure yesterday, in which they sent 236 drones and missiles across the country. And this looks to be dialing up again, as Ukraine's becoming more and more aggressive, seeking to use more and more Western arms and weapons inside Russian territory and go more on the offensive instead of just staying on the defensive. We also just heard the White House say Iran is still postured and poised to carry out an attack on Israel, in which they said they're committed to defending Israel, and if Israel wants to do a large-scale response to Iran, then they won't stop them either. And so like I said yesterday, some people out there may be seeing a closing window of opportunity for a potential showdown in Israel and Ukraine. Otherwise, how else would the industrial military complex significantly outperform even the hot performing S&P 500 full of tech over the last 25 years? And so the next few months could certainly be very interesting and just presents some tail risks for the markets out there. And just getting back into the charts, Volatility market's pretty calm going into tomorrow. Got the VIX at 15.4. There's a look at high yield bonds, still trading pretty elevated. The dollar still really weak down here at 100. Sharp turn back in Bitcoin today. Just seems to be constantly consolidating. Kind of like what was seen in crude oil as well. Gold sitting pretty, looking like it's doing a bit of a bull flag here. Ready to break out again. Same with silver, perking up a bit. Looks like we're getting some big volume coming in to the uranium ETF after it's pulled back the last few months. Maybe some investors buying the dip there. And growth sectors versus defensive sectors still weren't able to reclaim their 50-day VWAP, just like high beta versus low volatility stocks haven't been able to either. And same deal in discretionary versus staples. So still a lot of work to do for the market to really get in a risk on mode here. And tomorrow may just push the market in either direction enough to maybe change its tune for a few months at least. Still in that seasonally weak period. Upcoming federal election, 
heightened geopolitics. If Nvidia disappoints tomorrow, doesn't smash it out of the park with their numbers and guidance, we may get a big down day. However, if there's no reason for the market to get upset, I'd say we're in for a clean break to new all-time highs as well. So I guess we won't find out until after tomorrow's close. So make sure you come back to the Click Capital channel and I'll break it all down again for you guys and see what sort of price action we get out of Nvidia's earnings tomorrow. Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you again this time tomorrow. Cheers.